my name is Sinead McManus and I'm oh, oh, uh, the startup manager here. Um, Health Foundry, um, has anybody not been here before? Any newbies in the room? A couple of greets? So it's nice to see some familiar faces as well. So Health Foundry is a collaborative workspace for people using digital technology to solve big problems in health and well-being. We are funded by Guys of St. Thomas's charity and we've been open since September last year so we're coming up to our first birthday. Um, we uh, are a membership organisation, we've got three different levels of membership, our anchor teams who sit down the end of which Doctor Doctor is our biggest, and um, flexible membership and also a low cost but very high value, got that the right way around this time, and um, community membership. So if you're interested in talking more about uh, membership, um, please do grab me and Rich is also around, Rich, yes, it, with the uh, blonde hair in the back as well. Um, uh, we do three things with our startup, so first of all we support them to create great digital products that address a real user need, so that's the usual business support activities that you can imagine, and including things like access to finance. Um, secondly, we connect them to the healthcare system, especially locally here in Lambeth and Southwark, whether that's to the trust or to a local GP surgery. And lastly, we um, enable the healthcare system itself to innovate and adopt digital technology. So we're running a number of different projects like that, um, including uh, working with community pharmacy and with the local care networks on data sharing. So um, uh, it's a couple of quick housekeeping. In case you haven't found them, the toilets are um, down on the right-hand side. The um, password for the internet is my spleen. I don't know why I'm pointing here because I've no idea where my spleen is, uh, except on that piece of paper. Um, if there's a fire, we'll hit one of the fire alarms. The muster point is across the street at 10 Royal Street. But as I always like to say, so you guys have heard this joke before, we are the safest workplace in London because we have uh, St. Thomas's A&E, of course, across the street, and 20 very bored ambulance queues, um, um, queues? Um, a crowd waiting around the corner exactly um, for us so please um, if you were going to have a heart attack this is definitely the place for it but please not tonight because um, we've got lots in store for you um, and just lastly um, if you get a chance tonight um, do have a look at the art um, we, we're on a rolling exhibition every six months because it's a really nice space to showcase this is a collective called Room 2 who um, do art at the intersection of biology um, and science and health um, there's lots of drinks and food so please do stay around it's always brilliant networking at, the, at, at these events so meet as many people as you can, don't just chat to people you know, and um, uh, again, a really, really warm welcome. I'm going to hand over to Yinka, who's going to tell us a little bit about digitalhealth.london. Thanks, Sinead. Um, hi, so my name's Yinka McKinday. Um, I run something called digitalhealth.london. How many of you have heard of that? Show of hands. Brilliant. Excellent. Um, digitalhealth.london is an NHS um, sort of built, built uh, ecosystem. We bring really great innovations closer to the NHS and we also help to help innovators to navigate the complex NHS system. We do that in a number of ways, uh, including we run masterclass series for innovators, we run ecosystem events where you can actually meet with NHS colleagues, we run pitch events like this and we also have an accelerator program where we support uh, 30 companies, uh, high potential companies that are needing handheld support. Um, so we run these every two months, um, so please keep an eye out for them, please do come, please tell your friends and your colleagues and uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, it's called 5 by 5 by 5 because the concept is that we have five companies pitching at various stages of development. You, they each have five minutes to pitch and they each have five minutes of Q&A at the end. We're pretty tight on time so we will stop people at the five minute cutoff um, and we do invite questions and the whole purpose of this is for the pitchers to get real constructive feedback so please 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 do ask questions do challenge people want to learn they want to go home and they want to be able to refine what they're doing on the back of this um, just one last thing I think we've got we want to introduce uh, Thank you, um, so can I inter um, ask Dr. Chuck Tai to come to the the stage, please. So Dr. Chuck Dai is a fellow of the World College of Surgeons since 1993. He's got 25 years experience as an orthopedic surgeon at consultant level, 16 years experience as a medical IT specialist and has instructed over 50 medical IT courses. He is founder director of a medical software company with a portfolio of 15 medical software projects. Wow, so do grab him afterwards to find out more about that. And he is project director of Medical City Online, which is a one-stop shop for internet-based healthcare services and who are live streaming to Tonight's event. So, hello to everybody who's joining us online. Jack, Dr. Chuck Tai, could you tell us a bit more? Thank you, Sinead. I've been inspired by the last event. I was here last, last month. 
I, I saw Sinead and team doing uh, very focused work. I thought this is a great, great place to come and uh, contribute and add value to it. Being an orthopedic surgeon, being an IT expert, uh, there is no gap of communication when you develop a software. The biggest challenge we doctors face when we design a software is to translate what is required. That is the problem. Because the IT guy comes and says, well, I understood everything. But what we get back is not what we wanted or is not compliant with the patient-doctor communication. It does not do the job. It's great glossy screens, wonderful Im image. Wow, you click here, you go there, you click here, you go, come back. But it doesn't do the job. Or if it does do for the doctor, it doesn't do for the patient. It does for both. It doesn't meet the compliance. There's so many bridges to cross. So I thought of that about 10 years ago. Uh, I had been teaching IT as a hobby about 15 years ago, then took it seriously, carried on my clinical practice, and now I'm doing both. And sometimes it's 60-40, more, more IT than, than my, my clinical practice. Uh, so what I found was that if I do a software, if, I, if a doctor designs a software and has got IT know-how, he can, there's nothing lost in translation. Everything he needs, he will get it. So I tried with few softwares. I shared them as solutions to my colleagues, and they were adapted. That's 10 years ago. And that encouraged me to develop a software company, a medical software company, with my IT knowledge. I'm a Microsoft certified specialist. And of course, uh, in the medical field, I've been 25 years now. So I designed, started designing solutions, apps, softwares. And everything started working. So here I end up having designed a medical city online with several solutions. And my vision is, my vision is, if I may share, is to have a place on the internet where a doctor and a patient can find everything they want down in the commercial areas for medical health care. Also for training. The doctors can train there. Also for peer-to-peer -peer communication. Last month, we had a great uh, presentation by two of the colleagues who presented peer-to-peer -peer communication. That is there as well. And plus a new innovation like supervising a junior surgeon, not from theater. Like if I'm, I'm sitting here, on the mobile phone, I can watch my junior surgeon. Where is he putting endoscope? We have done it for teleangioplasty. We're doing it now. That a junior surgeon in a smaller city is doing angioplasty, and we're stopping him. Take the catheter out, go slow, that artery is not to be dilated, come back. The senior surgeon is sitting somewhere else. So we're going to be presenting all this later on uh, at this event in months to come. But today is just my way to say you hello and welcome. I, and we want to work together with you. And I hope that uh, this works well. Thank you. Thank you. So while we get the slides loaded up, there are a couple of seats at the front if anybody would like to come down and sit or, or you can stand for an hour. Right, we shall we'll try and start. So first of all, Thomas Souter, I'm a physiotherapist and I'm here tonight to talk about virtual physio. Um, before I start, first of all, thank you for having me to present. I'm first up, so this could be an advantage or disadvantage. <laughs> we shall see. So first of all, a bit about me. I'm a physio um, and a sports science graduate. I've been lucky, I suppose, in my career to work across the NHS, the private sector, a bit of work in pro sport and a bit of work in the military. So I'd like to think that I've had a bit of experience in different sectors. And I suppose that experience is echoed in the way that I think that we all sort of treat problems and address issues. This quote here, don't come to me with a problem, give me a solution. We hear that all the time in the military. Every day of the week, we get the officers to soldiers asking them, I don't want problems, I want to know how you're going to treat them. And I suppose without realising, this has sort of become the backbone of not only tonight's presentation, but the concept I'm going to present, which is virtual physio. So, a bit about physiotherapy for those who don't know. Just before I continue, how many clinicians have we got in the room? So we've got a few, cool, okay. Don't grill me too much at the end. Okay, so, a bit of background. I'm not going to read through all, this, all the points on every slide, but three golden nuggets to take from this start slide is the time, the cost, and also the impact on other services, such as GPs and such as the economy. Next thing, for me to come up with a solution or to address a problem, we have to really understand and digest the concept or a current model. So we looked at the pathway, we looked at both healthcare inequalities and geographical specialisms. This could be from a patient or a practitioner point of view. We looked at secondary referrals and we looked at the management and control of MSK conditions. So how are people being managed after they see a practitioner? 
And once we digested and understood this, we come up with a solution, which is quite simply virtual physio. Virtual physio is a sort of a remote face-to-face -face physiotherapy assessment. Now, it not only allows the practitioner, the physio, to provide a treatment and an assessment of the patient, but with the inclusion of over 3,000 sort of evidence-based videos of sort of rehab, we allow the management of patients' conditions. The days of, I don't know how many people have actually seen a physio, the days of seeing a stick man are long gone. The days of poor diagrams are long gone. We can now use video, we use in this technology to improve the service. Um, a few advantages, we've got real-time exercise demonstration. Again, for me, there's nothing worse than, as a physio. You see a patient, you give them exercises, they come back two weeks later, they've done them incorrectly. We are allowed via this software to go through the exercises step by step. So it allows us to improve our practice. Um, so, fair enough, great idea, but how have we turned an idea into innovative? Well, we've added value, and value for us is the key term. What we've done is by using sort of the self-referral pathway, we can reduce costs. We can reduce waiting lists. We have, by freeing up GP appointments, we're improving the service, not only in the physio sector, but allowing you to see your GP a lot quicker. Um, linking in with some of the orthopedic comments just mentioned, by seeing the right practitioner first time round, we can reduce the amount of x-rays, MRI scans, orthopedic surgery, the needs of that, which is costly. Physio is pretty cheap, £133 per session. You book in for surgery, it's pretty expensive. So we're looking at the, the, sort of the long-term costs of healthcare. We, we sort of dabbled a bit here with telemedicine. So self-referral has been in the NHS for quite a few years now. Unfortunately for me as a practitioner, only 30 to 40 percent of GPs are picking up on this. Only 30 to 40 percent of GPs are using the self-referral system. So we're still, we're still quite backwards. We haven't sort of evolved really from the days of face-to-face -face appointments. We've got two great quotes here from the Department of Health and the National Medical Director showing the importance of telemedicine. The next slide shows us that the telemedicine's got potential to really change what we're doing in the NHS. And these are the things we should be harnessing. We should be really using these. And we feel that virtual physio, it's not the answer to everyone's problems, but it's, it makes our current service just look a bit ancient. So let's use virtual physio to move us to where we need to be. Um, for me, probably concluding with all that, great idea, you understand the problem, but what have you actually done? So, key points. Virtual physio can reduce cost, key factor for any area of the healthcare. We can reduce healthcare inequalities. It doesn't matter where you are in the country, you're going to get seen by a physio, not a GP who's got specialists in different areas, not a physio with specialist areas, not a hospital with different specialities. We can have a localised centre that treats everybody the same, really putting patient care at the equality. Reducing secondary referrals. We know from research, if a, physio, if you, if a patient sees a physio first time round, we reduce secondary referrals. And that's it. Got there. It goes, it goes super quickly. It goes quick. it goes, do hang on to that for cool. the questions. We do, we've got a roving mic, so has anybody got any questions for Thomas? Great gentleman at the back in the check shirt. Just, it's a, the mic is running down to you, and then it runs. Great. Well, the beauty of, sort of the, the dual concept, you, we can call them back for referrals, so we can do a face-to-face -face referral over the video consultation, or the exercise have got built-in progressions. So we know from every base practice, level one, level two, and level three, and it allows us to manage, not prescribe, and there's a big difference. Physio isn't a recipe. There's not one size fits all. We need to be quite adaptable, and that's what the software allows us to do. <laughs> Evening. Yep. Um, I suppose the best way to answer that is we have to compare what we've got to what's currently out there. The only alternative is a telephone assessment. And the main feedback we got from that was the patient didn't feel engaged. They, didn't, they couldn't see the pr practitioner. So they don't know whether the patient's sort of filing the nails, eating the sandwich, or just sort of not fully understanding what's going on. And I think that's part of, that's part of a treatment. You have that rapport with the patient as soon as they walk in. And that's the feedback we've got. They enjoy seeing face-to-face. -face. And for the benefit of that, they can do it from their office. 
They can do it from the home. They can do it anywhere. So I suppose modifying what we've currently got and adding a few of the sort of sprinkling a bit of sugar and honey on the top to make it more of a better service. Yeah, just the, the value of physical manipulation versus uh, virtual manipulation. Yep. The trigger points. You yeah. Like pressure. And we, we refer patients versus the acupressure. Yeah. You can't do acupressure on that one. You how can't. Do you, how do you weigh the disadvantage versus advantage on this, this, this uh, Now, for me, this isn't the right forum to discuss advantages, disadvantages, manual therapy. Manual therapy's got its place. Do we do manual therapy in the NHS? If we look at every service, one review, one assessment, it doesn't happen anyway. There's very limited evidence to support manual therapy. We can't keep going down this manual therapy approach. It doesn't work. I'm lucky in sport that I can do it all the time. We see patients five minutes, 10 minutes every day. That isn't the NHS. You've got to treat what's in front of you and the environment you're in. Sorry, I don't quite follow. This seems to be like it could also be handled just by using Skype or FaceTime. Yeah, yeah, we use, it's very, very similar, but they're not HIPAA compliant. YouTube isn't guided by a professional. YouTube hasn't got that real-time engagement. So yeah, even though it's similar, let's use those benefits of those platforms and make them better. So if we subtract like, those subjects, we're still left with our product, but it's just a better version of what's currently out there. So that's sort of... Or have I just mumbled on? I don't quite understand what the acronym was, I'm not from the health sector. I just wasn't sure what the extra bit on top. Um, I suppose the only way I sort of go into clinical mode, if you were being assessed by someone on a YouTube or someone face to face over a FaceTime, what would you have more trust in? Me face to face or a YouTube video that could have been posted by anybody? Probably me. So that's, that's sort of getting rid of that component and you're doing it with a qualified provider. Now they are using a Skype tile service, so you're face to face with Skype or FaceTime, whatever we sort of terminology we put it in, you're having a face to face call with someone on your mobile, on a laptop, on a desktop. It removes the transport element of getting treatment. <laughs> There isn't, and that's what's going to happen. Virtual intelligence is going to take this because we're going to use algorithms to slowly but surely, that's, what, that's where the technology is going. And we can't stop that. We've just got to move the healthcare with it. Algorithms are forming so much of the NHS anyway. Most of the patients are screened by algorithms as it is. Most medical legal patients are screened using algorithms. They are there. They are being used. So we can't hide against them. They're, they're there. Thank you. I suppose that nicely sums up everything. In all fairness, there is, there is no one who we don't appeal to. And surprisingly, I was talking to a chap earlier on, and the people who we thought we were going to appeal to, the older market, for use better terminology, are the people who are now using the service, who want to use it because they have so many transport issues. We thought it would be a young market coming through who are so used to using the technology, but actually the software can be used in nursing homes. It can be used for patients who can't get, who are in remote areas. So there isn't really a demographic, because for us, what we've expected ended up being actually, you can, you, this has got more potential than the sort of nursing home, the false prevention, the myeloma patients. There is so many more areas where we can use this. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, right. you just pass the middle one to you. Cheers. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So, yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, as, I said, as they said, Charlie from Salve, we guide patients through life-changing treatment and help the clinics and hospitals that provide those services run more efficiently. So the problem that we're trying to solve is that patients going through these treatments typically are overwhelmed with the information that they've provided by the doctor, the nursing team, the administrators, but also what they find online as well. 
And this confusion, along with the stress and anxiety of going through the process, can actually cause quite a high number of non-urgent queries coming into the clinic. So that's calls, texts, emails, faxes even. Um, they're coming into the admin and nursing teams and they're actually causing a massive admin overhead. So our solution then is both a patient mobile app and also a clinic web-based dashboard. Both of those are cloud-based and both are synced to the in-house or incumbent EHR software, so the electronic health record that's used by the clinic. So that allows us to provide automated uh, drug reminders, appointment reminders, and also secure WhatsApp-like chat through to their caregiver. On the clinic side, we provide, again, a WhatsApp web-like chat feature. Uh, and we also provide a compliance monitoring tool so that the nursing team or admin team can have a look and see if anyone's dropping off and intervene if necessary. Um, we also provide a content management system for the clinics or hospitals to, to um, modify any of the content within the app and, and tailor it essentially to their best practices. So at the moment we're focused in the fertility industry, um, so that's women going through IVF or similar treatments. We have built... That's all right, that's my voice. <laughs> glad, glad it's working, that's all right. Um, good, good. So, as I said, currently focused on the fertility industry. We have built Salve to work across any secondary care setting. Um, in terms of the kind of main highlights of our traction, we've got one EHR integration. They cover about 10% of the global IVF market. That's 300 clinics in 28 countries, so that's an integration there. And we're just in the next three weeks about to launch a pilot with two of those clinics. So it's a paid pilot, we're very excited about it, been quite busy recently. Uh, and then bottom left, we've got another EHR that we're hoping to work with, that's Capture Fertility, and they're embedded in the NHS, so we're hoping to work with those guys towards the end of the year. This, the next one's a little bit of a different one. Um, we had a large pharmaceutical company approach us about three to four weeks ago uh, with the idea that they, we, they wanted what we had and they opened acquisition discussions and we haven't even launched yet, so it was a bit odd. Um, so it's good validation, a bit flattering, but we're not really sure what to do. <laughs> Um, so team, myself, uh, Ellen and Alex, we're all technologists, we're not clinical, but we have a really strong advisory board that we lean on for any domain expertise that we require. Alex has had two kids via IVF, so he's got a really nice bit of insight when he's going, making build decisions. Um, so what we're looking for today is essentially guidance from any clinicians that they think that Salve might um, work in their area of expertise, not just fertility. We're also open to speaking to any EHR vendor organisations, so if anyone has any contacts in those, it would be very interesting to speak to you. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we've got this conundrum with large pharma. Anyone who's gone through that process before would be more than happy to chat to you. Um, any watch outs, etc. It's a bit of a David and Goliath situation at the moment, so we're not sure how to handle it. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Charlie from Salve. It's not, it's proprietary, we've built it ourselves. Yeah. And how, how is the integration, what platform, is it a technical question? Is it a software platform or is it actually a different platform merged on a single, single API? So it's, it's, it's all our, our software and then when we, when we integrate with the EHRs, we hit their API and get the data out. So essentially, for those non-technical people, it means that the, the clinical staff input data in the clinic and then it just appears on the patient's phone. So the patient never has to update or in, input any information to remind them when to take their drugs. So it's quite useful that it's automated, essentially. So it's all just hitting an API, basically, to answer your question. Yeah. Yeah, so, so at the moment we provide automated drug reminders, automated appointment reminders, and then information around those two. So in the fertility space, a, a woman might be injecting five times a day and having to mix those drugs. So we provide guidance videos on how to do that. And that can be modified using the CMS on the clinic dashboard. So for a, a different clinic might have different drugs and they can tailor that content themselves. Pretty much, yeah. The, the, reason, the, reason, the reason we say that we're focused, as I said, the reason we're focused on fertility at the moment is because we've got a network there, but it can be replicated at any secondary care setting is where we're looking, essentially. Can I ask a follow-on question? Yeah. I'll just use your mic. So you said it could be replicated in any other secondary care setting. Have you got an idea about what may say your next three areas might be that you're looking into? Yeah, I think I might have missed, did I miss off the first one? I mean, we want to talk to clinicians, essentially, to see where they think this might be 
useful for their teams, essentially. Um, we think that oncology would be really useful just because of the number of drugs that people have to take. Um, but, but really, we're kind of open to, to, to talking to people and, and listening to them. Well, yeah, I mean, we, there's, there's a, there are other companies that are doing this in the primary care space um, and, and monitoring chronic diseases. But yeah, we want to just nail the kind of um, where there's a defined treatment regimen, essentially, and defined pathway. Sure. Yeah, we're, <coughs> we're a SaaS-based business model. We, we actually charge the clinics um, on a monthly subscription basis. So the patient doesn't pay for anything. It's all B2B between us and the clinics. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, well, I mean, we've, we've been going about 18 months, and a large part of that has been um, making sure that we're compliant and making sure that the data that we pass around is secure. Ultimately, the patient signs uh, consent that we can access it, but they, they own the data. The patient owns their own healthcare data. It's in the palm of their hand, essentially. Um, but yeah, we've spent a lot of money with legals uh, to try and get to a point now where we are compliant and we're good to go. Yeah, so yeah, the way the product works at the moment is we can we anonymize it and pseudonymize it, and then it can be passed on to pharma and also to research in this, uh, institutions, essentially. Any other questions for Charlie? Yeah, great one in front of the back. Uh, we can I can do a run, or we can do it from the flat back. Are you? Are there any other questions after this one? Just let me know to put the back next. No. Okay. So we'll take this as the last question, and we'll move on. So, I mean, it's, there's, there's dual functionality there in that, yes, it's a messaging system. It removes some of the stress and anxiety for the patient being able to talk to the, the hospital. But also, um, by integrating with the EHR, the patient doesn't have to ever remind themselves when to take their medication or remind themselves when they've got an appointment. Um, so it's, it's, it's the automated feature that's actually different to the other drug reminder and appointment reminder apps that are out there. Okay. So, so that's similar in fertility. It's something that they're actually really excited. Yeah, so something that's actually interesting on the fertility end, we're actually driving data integrity on the clinic end by them bringing on our service. So it's, it's actually helps them make sure they're putting everything into the EPR. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's definitely a tipping point. It's about it's about channeling all of the conversations through one one channel. Because in a way, a clinic appointment like acted exactly like that, kind of stop that access. I'm gonna ask that you guys take this up a little bit. All right. Cool. Thank, well you. Thank you very much, Jim. Okay, this one, okay. Thank you very much for introduction. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, as you can imagine, I'm not from this country and will be more evident throughout my presentation. Um, well, we are a real-time assistant uh, supporting healthcare performance. What does it mean? We started a few years ago dealing with public health care in Italy and uh, where what we found is that hospitals went through uh, the adoption of IT tools through years. So many vendors participating to the landscape uh, during years providing solutions that can or cannot interoperate properly depending on uh, how each vendor is open to share his own data or on how much time has been spent in dealing with integration. So this can lead to poor team and patient communication. I mean, uh, if the information is not uh, available at hand, uh, when a patient inquiry arrive, uh, a physician may take some time in order to answer to the patient. For example, when I will undergo surgery, 
I don't know, we will call you when it's time. So that a kind of issue which on the other side reflect a problem in the communication between people. So people dealing with patients may not be uh, in connection with people just scheduling theater or working in pre-admission clinic. Uh, another drawback of poor integration is on the planning because uh, when you don't have data, you cannot have a perspective on all resources. Typically, hospitals work on resources assigned on uh, surgical units, and this could lead to inefficiencies, because if you allocate some resources to a unit, and then that, that unit is not able, for whatever reason, to put patients into the theater, that could be uh, lead to a, well, to not to a misuse or to underuse of a, of a theater, of a surgical theater. So this is reflected, as you can see in the newspaper, in the NHS, uh, uh, issues on waiting times. But this is the rather biggest impact you c we can see on, on patients. This source is from The Guardian, which has been told is left wing, so I went to for other sources uh, <laughs> and found that not only The Guardian is uh, wor working or speaking against the NHS, it's fairly uh, objective, the attacks. Um, from every side. So uh, the latest uh, issue is that the NHS said it is going to drop the 18 weeks pledge on waiting times with constraint in terms of surgeon from the Royal College of Surgeon that said, okay, the, on one side it is good to fund accident and emergency department, it is good to find uh, cancer departments, but we cannot forget hip replacement or knee replacement because if you undergo surgery uh, too late, uh, the surgery became more complex, length of stay will increase, this chair may require rehab, and that, that, that is an issue and an increasing cost. So dropping a waiting time pledge may be not the right decision. So we worked and we found that it's possible to, uh, but to put it simple, to prioritize. Every, in every business sector, companies prioritize. A software company prioritize how they solve on the issue on their software, while uh, a logistics company may prioritize on how uh, packages are delivered to customer houses. So why not to prioritize in, in, in healthcare w while respecting NHS waiting time and NHS pledges? That means that I can have today a waiting list which is organized like that. So not a bunch of data spread across different systems, but an organized view a comprehensive view on all of the patients, organized by priority, so in top people that must undergo surgery first, and on bottom people that might must undergo uh, surgery later, which is not a matter of software deciding what to do instead of the clinician. That's an important point, and that's why we call ourselves a real-time assistant. But it's a matter of providing in real time the information on how many patients do you have on your list which are going to breach, for example, in the next month? That can be lead to better allocation of pre-admission clinic resources, to better allocation of theater, and also to better communication in the team. If you have gal gallbladder or gallbladder without pain, well, that, that's, that's a completely different process in the hospital. If you have pain, you may undergo a magnetic resonance, for example, and if the requesting physician, ask for that investigation too late, probably you are going to breach. So having a dashboard that help you uh, rise or make it evident uh, and every issue, uh, an anesthetist requiring further investigation, a patient canceling an appointment or whatever, from clinical to logistical to communication issues, make more, mm, more efficient management of the process So, at, at a glance. So, that's the story. Sorry. Okay, you, you hold on to that. Hopefully somebody can ask sure. a question later. But thank you, Matt. So, any questions from the audience? We have our moving mic right here. Why do I start with question? So, what sort of traction have you seen? Yeah, thank you very much for letting me, <laughs> for letting me explain. <laughs> that's light. <laughs> Really, appre really appreciated. We, we had customers in Italy which helped us to validate the process from a clinical point of view, and we are running a service improvement project at Royal London Hospital in a surgical unit, which helped us to better suit the product to NHS needs and also to extract first metrics in terms of how much how many time can be see how much time can be saved uh, in managing the patients. Thank you. 
the feedback is it's really beautiful to have all the information in a very single place. Because, for example, to check if a patient is going to breach, uh, they have to query different systems and maybe make some calls, send an email. Depending on what I said before, uh, is that patient going to, to need some investigation or is it ready for surgery? In, in, our, in our system, if a patient is ready for surgery, is, is just, uh, well, he has just completed all light lab, some icon. So it's an immediate information. And they just log in and they can see that. Yeah, depending on the role, of course, uh, depending on the role of the user, they can access different type of information. Yeah. Um, do you have, uh, do you see similarities uh, between the two systems, between the system and the UK system? Yeah, sure they are, because basically the UK is on the beverage model which has been adopted by Italy. So that's, that's the reason why we are going to UK, because yeah. that could be a springboard for other countries that are following on the UK model, and also because uh, the systems are pretty similar, public funded, uh, similar issues. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure, sure it is. Mm. Uh, wh when we call ourselves uh, a platform with some deep learning inside, well, th the real truth is that we are able, for example, to provide automatic scheduling of, of surgical theater, considering also bad occupancy. So that can be used not necessarily in an operational way, but also in a simulation way, just to provide uh, a first uh, idea of what kind of resources I will need, for example, in the next month. Yeah, exactly. Starting from consultant visit up to discharge. Yeah, great. Thank you. 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 It's, it's, it's important to, to understand what, what we make automatic because you, if, if, if there is too much automation, then you tend to be a sort of medical device which will provide a decision or, an indica or, a, or a strong indication of treatment to the clinician, like uh, uh, monitoring equipment in the theater, for example. So if you tell the clinician you have to, go, you have to take this patient, put it in the, into the operating theater today, you are... Uh, on some way, helping the clinician take a decision, and on the other way, you are, well, telling the, the clinician what, what he should do. So we should be aware of what we make automatic and what, what is not. Because, well, being a medical device and prescribing uh, uh, surgery is, is a completely different uh, topic. Um, Ivan, you're starting with elective waiting lists. Are there any other processes or pathways that you can see that, uh, that, you're, that you're planning next? Uh, we are focused on elective because it's, well, not an urgent or whatever, but not only on surgery, well, medical treatment or uh, mental health treatment or access to social care or to rehab. Whenever there's a queue, we may be have a role. But since we validate what we do, we I am, I'm confident on surgeries, I'm confident on acute trust processes, I'm happy to, to find someone to partner on other type of processes. I feel there's a song there somewhere, when there's a queue, <laughs> there, there we are, wonderful, thank you very much. Okay. Hello everyone, my name's Naomi Bennett, I'm a registered nurse and I'm also the inventor of a product called Neoslip. Neoslip is an easy to use device which I developed whilst a student at, at Kingston University. Neoslip is a low friction pouch which helps patients to put on their compression stockings. I, 
I currently supply 34 hospitals across the UK. Neoslip is available on prescription, and more recently, since May this year, Neoslip is um, available via NHS supply chain. You can also purchase Neoslip from Boots Pharmacies across the UK. So, um, sorry. so today, I'd like to introduce to you my new product. Oh, sorry. I'm really not good at presenting, so please forgive me for that. So, right, so... Um, Milestones, yeah, so they're the milestones that I've reached with Neosit. So today I'd like to introduce um, to you my new product, which focuses on drug rounds. I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar with um, the ward drug round that nurses do on a day-to-day -day basis, but they can be very tricky. ...reported during the administration of medication. Of 100 uh, reports of death and harm, most were caused by wrong med administration, 41% with unclear wrong dose or frequency, wrong medication, delayed medic medicines account for also 21% of fatal and serious harm. You've also got this do not disturb apron, which is an attempt to reduce the risk of being interrupted during the drug round, but there are some, still some other um, risk factors present. Oops, I've gone too far. I oh, know, I haven't, sorry. Yeah, so this is a typical drug trolley used frequently within a ward area. Um, these, are, these are actual different trolleys that I've just seen myself in different hospitals and they're, they're very congested and there's so much on, on, the, um, on the trolley and often the, the keys go missing. Obviously I'm a nurse so the keys go missing, no one can ever find the keys um, and sometimes the nurse will go off for a break and they're in her pocket. So, um, <laughs> so basically my, my new idea, um, um, my solution is, this is a, a product called the Neo Med Caddy. And this slide, show, this slide shows the current process of the medical journey when entering the hospital. So it enters the trust, it's uploaded to the system, it's displayed and supplied before it becomes ward stock. This is where my product Neomedi will um, support administration. So this sli slide shows, if you see in the corner there, there's the nurse. She will go to the Medi, um, the Medi and put in her details, the patient details and the drug medication details. Um, the information will um, report back to the central server, which will check the information, in, and if everything's correct, the medication will be dispensed using like a vending machine technology, almost like putting your, um, your card in an ATM to withdraw cash. If there's an error, the server will send an alert to provide the nurse with additional information, such as the dose or the known um, contraindication. Um, this is how the um, Medicaddy looks. Um, there are, there are compartments for each medication. Each, each medication will be orderly and tidy. Most wards have a standard set of medication, which is about 30 for each speciality. Um, we will um, monitor and restock the medication using these codes. Um, and that will prevent medication also going missing, because then you can trace medication and you won't rely on just paper um, input on what's short, of, um, short on the wards. So basically, the Neo Caddy, um, Caddy is for um, healthcare professionals who dispense and administer medication with a, within a healthcare setting. Um, and it's, a, it's basically a networked medicine dispenser um, that will eliminate human error and prevent patients from being wrongly medicated, unlike the current drug trolley. Um, our product will support the easy administration of medication. Thanks. So sorry, I, I must say that that was the first time I've actually pitched that product. We've been working on it since 2014. Neoslip, I can um, pitch that like off like the back of my hand, and I've been on Dragon's Den. I've pitched a lot for it, but this was literally the first time I'm presenting it to you guys because I'm, I'm I'm looking forward to your expertise. Right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so my question is um, regarding the human error factor. You're trying to remove the human error from the whole yeah. um, Just the question on when you're putting the drugs, we're trans transferring the drugs into that, the, the caddy itself. Mm -hmm. Isn't there an opportunity for human error there? Or how well, you go well uh, currently the pharmacist comes on and fills up the drug trolley. So basically that would be the pharmacist's role to just fill up as they do normally. So the, um, the caddy will actually just confirm what's going into the machine. 
So, yeah, it's already been um, manually put in by the pharmacist, so it would really just support that operation. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I've got some developers that are developing the software, and I think that's what we will be protecting, because the vending machine, we're kind of um, trying to find one um, that's more tailored, smaller, because, I don't know, there is some medicine ma um, cabinets already in, in the system, but they're usually huge, and they're very expensive, so um, in re with regards to um, the vending, that will be something that we've tailored, and also the um, software will be something that the software developers will protect by way of um, copyright. Um, or however the stuff, yeah. Can I ask a follow-up question to that? So, what's your USP? You said there are other cabinets. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it's USP, like unique selling point. Right, so for, for example, I've actually used one of the big, large um, dispensers, and they are very big, and they're very costly, and they don't, like, they, they tend to be used in A&Es because of the mix of medication, but in terms of individual wards, um, the, the, there's not really anything to support the nurse with that operation. Yeah so, so, yeah, so what we, we were saying, we were proposing to um, keep the barcodes, so when the um, product comes into the hospital, it's barcoded, and everything, it, like, follow, like every time it's checked in and out of somewhere, it goes to the server, so the server will basically have all the information. At the moment, if a ward, for example, because tramadol seems to be a popular one, that literally just goes missing, but with this trolley, um, it... it that, yeah, that, that would prevent that from happening because every time the nurse puts her card in, it will register that what she's taken. And also as well, to make the space, what we will do is take out the blisters out of the boxes so we can identify like the, um, the, de the um, expiry date and stuff like that. It just frees up the space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tell you, devices, so much time yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. We, we are working on the first prototype now, so... Well, to be honest, I, 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 when I went into, because I don't actually, because of my business with Neoslip, I can't actually, um, I do like bank work. So every ward I go to, it, it, it takes so long. Like obviously the nurses get used to that mess and they get faster it. But when you're just coming in, you know, like we, there is a lot of agency nurses, it can take you all day to make sure you safeguard your patients. So in terms of time, it will definitely save time. And like I say, with the keys, I'm sure if they time the amount of, of time wasted looking for keys, that would probably um, make a difference. It's per medication, so it's it's a general. It's the same as what you see in the medical, uh, in the in the trolleys, uh, the traditional trolleys. It would just be an electronic version. So all those boxes that we saw, instead of them being just anywhere, because every single trust you go to, the medication are all over the place. But with the caddy, it will be a set, um, a uniform um, style. Because it will check with the server. So say, for example, a patient is having aspirin, um, we, we have to give that with water, we have to dissolve it. So it, it, a little prompt will come up to remind the nurse. Or, you know, if there's contraindications, things just pop up. So it, it, sometimes the nurse will have to, like, we have to go and refer to the BNF, for example. So what we do is we put the information from the BNF into the system. Okay. I'm going to have to shut it down now. So, gentlemen, you had questions, but maybe just grab me and get the drinks after. All right, thank you. <laughs>um, so, hi, I'm Lydia. I'm a junior doctor. I'm here with my team from Forwards, so as Philip, Will, and Lucinda. And the first thing to say is that this business really should never have happened. And that's because I'm engaged to Philip, and you should absolutely never work with your fiance. <laughs> 
So the story is that I started work two years ago, come home every day um, hugely frustrated at the communication and workflow challenges that I was having. So not being able to contact people with pages, waiting by the phone, using WhatsApp and Snapchat as a workaround, and carrying around a paper list. Um, so if I just move on and show you just the middle one. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yep. So this is literally the state of clinical communication in the NHS at the moment. And it's not only in the NHS, in fact, it's literally all over Europe. So bleeps. Um, don't need to explain the problems with those for any of you that have used them. But if any of you haven't, you have no idea whether you're being bleeped to prescribe a laxative or because somebody has stopped breathing in A&E. It's a huge waste of time going to answer the phone, waiting for the phone to ring. You have to leave the patient's bedside. Um, WhatsApp, obviously not legal, um, com combined with your social messages from your mum, from your friends, and paper handover lists. So every doctor will carry around a list of patients that they're looking after, that annotate that during the day. That gets lost, and then you lose your entire task list for that day. It's data protection issue. It's really inefficient. So that's what we're using at the moment. I'll try again with this thing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's what led to Forward. So Forward is the clinical communications and workflow platform for doctors. Um, we basically did some research because I, I didn't know whether the problems I was having were unique to me or whether they were universal. So we surveyed about 120 doctors and we found that um, pretty much everybody wanted a solution to this set of problems. So we focused on what people really wanted, which was secure messaging. Um, it was tasks. So, for example, if you're in a small team of doctors and you're separated in the hospital, one of you um, goes to book a CT, maybe the other person goes to book the same CT for the same patient. You've both wasted half an hour, essentially. Um, people also wanted a, a patient notebook. So, like the handover list, something that you could carry around with you and annotate live. So, say a patient's admitted to A&E under your team, you then add that patient, everybody on your team can then see that there's a new patient, they can see what needs to be done for them. It just gives you a bit of control. And I think that's, that's the key about this. Doctors are leaving the NHS in droves. People's morale is an absolute low. This is about giving people some of that time and autonomy and morale back. Um, next slide, please. Thank you very much. Okay, so trust we've trialled in. So Frimley, um, we trialled for two-week period there, and people sent about 6,500 messages. So that is a lot of communication. Doctors and clinical teams communicate a lot. Um, we also have Medway using the platform now. We have about 250 users there. Um, the feedback's been overall really positive so far. Um, so next one, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a quick thing on how do you make this safe, because you're probably all thinking patient details on personal phones, that sounds very worrying to me. Um, we've made this compliant with the NHS IG toolkit, um, so it's two-factor authenticated, you have to have an NHS email address to log in, um, you have to, there's a PIN protection function, and we follow all the guidelines for data protection in the EU and the UK. No data stored on the device, if you lose your phone it's not an issue, that's just wiped. Um, great. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Fantastic. Who's got questions for Lydia? Thanks. Yes, Um, so Streams was developed to manage AKI, essentially, and the communication platform is fairly basic. Lots of systems, even some that we've heard about today, will have communication platforms built into them, but they don't give junior doctors exactly what they need to be efficient at work. So that's essentially the difference. That was developed to manage AKI. We're managing a universal problem. Uh, yeah, Eva, does it have a question? Great, and then at the front. Thank you for your presentation. Have you also considered the 
patient physician communication. Uh, yeah, where WhatsApp definitely, is definitely. And I think that's, that's a real issue at the moment. Patients don't necessarily take in what's gone on in the ward round. They might not know which doctor's actually looking after them, which nurse is on today. So that's something we'd love to do in the future. But I think for a patient-facing platform, that's a much bigger thing. <laughs> really, we have to tackle this first. But it's a great idea, yeah. So currently it's free because we just really felt that this problem needed to be solved. Um, we want to gather as much feedback as we can from users. And by the way, that doesn't just include doctors. It's got obvious potential for nurses, physios, etc., who currently aren't talking to each other. Their handover sheets are like completely different. Um, so we, I mean, we don't have a business model essentially yet. We have a number of ways in which this could be sustainable, but I think the first thing is to see what really works for people. It's offline, it has an offline mode, it uses the same data and battery as WhatsApp. So, what is the offline mode? So, you can type messages, but it won't send until it's online. Well, <laughs> you, you, you're going to have to find some Wi-Fi, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely true. But, you know, 99%, and I'm not even exaggerating, of clinical teams are using WhatsApp at the moment to communicate. So they must be getting data from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we've thought of mesh networks. We've actually thought a lot about um, use in other countries and perhaps like wilderness settings. And that's something that we'd be keen to develop. But I think you know, hospitals finally are getting good Wi-Fi networks. That is happening. So I think w it's, it's not really an immediate problem because people are using platforms that rely on data. OK, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and yet people manage, so. Yeah, sure. Um, so we face this question about integration a lot. I think most platforms do. We purposefully do not integrate because we want a universal platform so that when doctors and nurses move hospitals, they're doing locum shifts in different places, they can still use forward. The things that happen clinically to the patient on this platform need to be recorded, just like if you were to take a bleep from you know, another specialty, you would record in the patient notes that you've done that. If you've ordered a CT scan, you would record that in the notes. It's, it's a completely separate thing. Well, yeah, but if you imagine bleeping someone to tell them something or instant messaging them to tell them something. That's, that's all we're doing really. We're just creating a more efficient way of that process happening. So all these communications are already going on in a very inefficient way. Okay, wonderful. Great. Thank you. Hi, so would you kindly introduce us all? Just tell us your name and what do you do work-wise? My name is uh, Deepa Shri Patil. I work at Guys and St. Thomas's as an outpatient transformation manager. But in my previous life, I have worked with the risk and patient safety a lot. So a lot of my questions today were intended in terms of risk and patient safety and sustainability because we, things come and go and we just go through the whole lot of changes in the NHS and I think people are tired of that. Um, so I think that was, but I really enjoyed this. This is the first event I've been to and I really enjoyed it. 
Berlin. And just quickly, which one was your favorite speaker? My favorite speaker was Salve, um, but I voted for Forward because I saw more potential into that app. And I think our doctors, I mean, from my past experiences, our junior doctors leave very quickly before they actually complete training because they feel isolated and scared about what's going to happen. And I think that is a good, good network for them to you know, belong together. My name is Charlie Kenny. I'm one of the co-founders of Salve. And please tell us a little bit um, what your company does and what you're looking to achieve. So Salve guides patients through secondary care treatments and it also helps the, the clinics and hospitals that offer those services run more efficiently in doing so. so that's um, and um, you obviously you were the best out of the presenters. And which one uh, speaker did you like the most? Uh, I really like Forward. I think they're definitely solving a problem um, that, that needs to be solved. So my sister's a doctor as well, and I know that everyone's using WhatsApp in hospitals, and it's, it is illegal, it's not compliant. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely a, a problem to be solved, and it sounds like they're making really good traction. So, so congratulations, Faz, of winning this evening with your presentation. Just please tell us quickly your name, um, your company that you represent, and what made you to create this amazing system that you want to do. Okay, so my name is Lydia. Um, I'm a junior doctor. I'm representing Forward, which is a clinical communications and workflow platform for all healthcare professionals. I'm um, created out of frustration, really. So my own job, um, inefficiencies, time wasted, and just wanting to spend more time with patients being a doctor. Beautiful. Um, it's, it was really, really amazing, and I think you're actually helping a lot of doctors to save a lot of time and actually manage the system much easier. Um, apart from you obviously being the best presenter this evening, which one did you like most? Okay, um, I actually, because I really resonate with this chaotic ward environment, I loved the um, caddy, the medication caddy. Um, I just think that's a fantastic idea. Anything that can reduce medication error, um, increase patient safety is just right, right up there for me. Okay, my name's Naomi Bennett and today I was representing Neo Innovations UK Limited. Okay, and please tell us quickly what your company does for viewers possibly who actually missed your presentation. Okay, so Neo Innovations UK Limited, we develop um, nurse and patient inspired product. Our first product is called Neo Slip and this is a um, low friction device to help patients put their stockings on after an operation. Brilliant, and you actually involved in quite a few projects from what I heard tonight. What are your other projects? Yeah, so at the moment we're working on a device that will help to reduce uh, medication errors at ward level for nurses and patients, yeah. Brilliant, amazing presentation, thank you very much and we hope to see you in September. Yeah, thank you and thanks for um, giving me the opportunity to pitch today, it was really good.